Welcome to the first of the Pier Glass Poetry Panels, a series comprised of poets and editors talking about their work. This first panel is entitled, So You Want to Write a Poem, and we'll be hearing from poets on both sides of the Atlantic. If you are joining us live, we ask you not to use the chat function, but instead send your questions and comments through the Q&A box at our website, peerglasspoetry.wixsite.com slash mysite. We'll take a look at those toward the end of the show, but now let's get started and meet our first poet. Carrie Gunter Seymour is the Poet Laureate of Ohio. Her collection, A Place So Deep Inside America It Can't Be Seen, earned her the 2020 Ohio Poet of the Year Award. Her work was included in the PBS American Portrait Poem Remix for My People, put together by former U.S. Poet Laureate Natasha Trethaway. Her poems appear in numerous journals and publications, including Burst Daily, Rattle, and the New York Times. Gunter Seymour has provided poetry workshops to incarcerated teens and adults and women in recovery, a ninth generation Appalachian. She is the founder and executive director of the Women in Appalachia Project and editor of its anthology series, Women Speak. We're happy to have you here. Well, thank you, Stan, and hello, everyone. Carrie, you are the Poet Laureate of Ohio. What do you tell someone who says, I'd like to write a poem? How do I do that? Well, Stan and, and all, I always advise new poets to write from your sense of place. Because what do we know better than our own sense of place? So I'm going to share a few of my poems and some personal thoughts as to why I feel so strongly about this. And the first poem is going to come from my collection that Stan mentioned, a place so deep inside America, it can't be seen. And this is the anchor poem. I come from a place so deep inside America, it can't be seen. White oaks thrash. Moonlight drifts the ceiling as if I'm underwater. Propane coils warms my bones. Gone are the magics and songs, all the things our grandmothers buried. Piles of feathers and angel bones inscribed by all who came before. When I was 12, my cousins called me ugly, enough to make it last. Tonight, a celebrity on Oprah imagines a future where features can be removed and replaced on a whim. A moth presses wings thin as paper against my window, more beautiful than I could ever be. Ryegrass raised seedy heads beyond the bull thistle and preen. Everything alive aches for more. So I think this poem directly addresses where I'm from. Stan mentioned I'm an Appalachian poet, ninth generation. And starting with the title, A Place So Deep Inside America It Can't Be Seen. So where did you go when I first announced that? Where did you go? Think about that. Because you may not have gone rural at first. You may have gone inner city. So a title like that, and we know titles are very important, right? Uh, so I think what happens, though, in my first line, I pull you away from the city into the, the rural when I say that white oaks thrash. And then later on, I use the word propane, and these are, these are things that are very common to me and may not be to someone else who hasn't lived the life that I've lived. So your question might be, why should I write from my sense of place? And I just will say again, a strong sense of place helps your readers make that leap from their everyday existence into another world. So that's your world, whether it's the past, the present, or the future. You can help them do that by creating like clear, concise visuals for readers and listeners. I like to think of it as a painting. 
And the more detailed, the richer the painting, right? So the more detailed, the richer the poem. So let's just real quick think about how one writes from a sense of place, because it's not quite as easy as you think, because you really have to immerse yourself, okay? So before you create a sense of place on the page, you've got to go into this world that you want to create. And uh, you want to make that alive for you personally, because if it's not alive for you, you're not going to get it on the page and your readers are not going to feel it. So the way to do that is to do uh, a lot of reading, research, you can travel, you can think back, like do some, you know, recollection, you do observation, obviously, you can use your imagination, or you can simply write what you already know. And list making is one way to do that. That's a great way to do it. What do you know? Make some lists about what you know that others may not. For instance, if you love to bake, you know, Try writing some recipe poems. They are very, very popular right now. And if you're into cross-country skiing, let's say, then, wow, you have a ton of stuff to write about because you can start with just the kind of skis you strap to your feet, how you strap them. Write about the terrain, the wildlife, the weather, your personal reactions, as well as anyone or anything you encounter. Or maybe you don't encounter anything or anyone, which means you write about loneliness. Or maybe you write about freedom. Yes. Make sure you use your senses, all the senses, not just your visual. Sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. And unfortunately, most writers fall into this visual description of things, and they leave out the others when many times the others are much more uh, potent and um, uh, there's more potential to engage your reader with a sense of being there. If they can smell the same things you smell and taste the same things you taste and hear those things, you need to be specific. So uh, rather than uh, giving a general description of something, because readers tend to skip past uh, when you make generalities, like birds singing in the trees, but if you say the blue jays or the chickadees or the sparrows, those have specific associations, right? And they actively contribute to a sense of place. And then talk about the sound they make. Each is unique. Describe their shape. What's the shape of the bird? How does it fly? What does it eat? Where does it nest? You see where I'm going, right? Now, the other thing that you might try is dialogue, so distinctive dialogue to a particular place, patterns of speech, dialect, endearments, expletives, and colloquialisms. And I use a lot of that in my work, as you will see as I read a few more poems. Think about environment. Describe where your poem is taking place. Don't tell us. Describe it. Use your words, metaphor, and descriptors. Use devices, repetition, rhythm, alliteration, assonance. You know, are you a mountain person? Desert? Beach? The minute I mention sand, we're all off. We're beach bound, aren't we? But what if I add the word gravel? As in, below her feet, sand and gravel. Now, where do you go, right? So lastly, I want to encourage you to put in all the feels. Make sure there's emotion and reaction and use the five senses again to do this. So I'm going to share a little poem that's just kind of full of all kinds of things for you to wrap your mind around and try to put you in a place and tell you a little bit about the sense of where I'm from. And it's called Subsequently Hereafter. If my name were an animal, it would be brown dog, dreaming of squirrels to hound, near empty dinner plates, buried bone maps, a certainty of trees. If a spice, it would be fennel, musty after rain, raindrops swelling the bud point of every bough, a murmuration of starlings circling the clouds. If my name were a spirit, it would be barrel aged, laughter laced in undertones of honey, fig, and citrus, the burden for truth unfettered. If the color, 
the hour before a thunderstorm, a cerulean warbler, or stalwart stalks of chicory, jagged petals roiling their tongues in waves. If my name were music, it would be the hurrah of a doe, hoof deep in acorns and orange gold leaves, the cicadas calling me home, home, home. So I personally often blend ancestral history in my work, and I'm known to take up a few causes as well. I try not to get preachy, but sometimes. So this one is called Perfect Pitch. I rode middle school bound in the back seat of my aunt's station wagon, listening to her and mama sing Jolene, trading verses, harmonizing on the chorus. I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. A few years later, it was nine to five. They were fired up and it was Dolly's doing. This was rural Ohio the bottom lip of northern Appalachia, right shy of Perry Como country. The women in my family worked the TS trim factory, spitting out Honda car parts, started out on the assembly line, worked their way up to paint, then detailing, then welding. The physical labor made their bodies strong, their future bright, and like Dolly, they weren't taking any shit. They learned early on about strikes and picket lines, how important it was to organize and vote. Brave women in the workforce, determined to see their daughters inside college classrooms the hell out of factory road. I didn't know then I was being raised by a feminist taking back her power. Like Dolly, my mama never would use that word, no matter how much she embodied it. She was proud to hang up her welder's helmet in the shift, pick up her paycheck, sing in the front seat of a station wagon with women she loved. So, you see, I added a little music to that one, yes? And it's a surprise, right? It's, it enhances the experience. So this is another handy device to put the reader or listener into your poem to really bring them in. And they have their own memories. I wonder how many of you, when I sang a little bit of Jolene, had a little memory of your own, maybe, from that song somehow uh, reaching into your own life. Um, <clears throat> As I said, I do take up causes, and I think this is a poem that's rich in descriptors, environment, and has all the feels I was talking about. And I will give you a little bit of a trigger warning. I am the mother of a combat veteran, so again, I write from what I know. And when I do read, I always send one out to those who serve, have served, and to their families. And this is called Saving Sergeant Billings. We did what we could, hid the bottles, drove what was left of him deep into the yawning hollow, built a campfire, drank water from a long handled gourd, a galvanized bucket. We set up tents for triage, counted his breaths, worried over irregular heartbeats Sweats, persistent vomiting, his jacked up adrenal system. We waited, listened for a canvas zipper in the night, each long, slow pull, a call to duty, our legs folding over duct taped camp stools, tucked tight around the fire, his gut fucked stories stenched in blood and munitions overpowering the wood smoke's curling carbons. Crows haunched on branches behind our backs, sentinels silent as we wept 
We doused him in creek water, a sharp sheen of moon over our bones, recited communions, sang songs our mothers taught us in the womb, every neighbor dog and coyote within earshot barking hill to valley. Some people think they don't deserve to be loved. Every story scratched into the dirt and ache. That week, down in the lower 40, we all got born again. It's hard to say who saved who. So I hope you're getting the gist of what I'm getting at here as far as, you know, creating environment and um, excitement with music, the language making noise, making some um, impressions of colloquialisms and certain words that speak to your sense of place while coming up with device of repetition, assonance and rhythm. And so I'm going to leave you with this one last poem. Um, because I mentioned that you might need to do some research, even if you work from your sense of place. And um, I had to do some research for this poem. Uh, and I, I, I also, I, I get a little emotional with this poem. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to give you a trigger warning too. Um, I combined it with what I know and also what I felt about this situation. I, I wrote this the day after George Floyd was murdered. And it's called Today, I'm Lying in the Fetal Position. I want to scribble lines about the bluebird duo pecking, pecking at my morning window, a flap like wrung out hummingbirds, chittering as if the place were on fire. Google tells me bluebirds are at great risk of predation highly vulnerable, even inside their nesting box, which must be fortified just so. I want to wax on about how the male's blue black wings and blood orange throat make him stand out markedly against the affluent green of spring compared to the pallidness of his missus and myself. I don't want to write about George Floyd, black and blue, or the shadow that blocked the sky at his throat for eight minutes, a pasty pale punk with a badge, kneeling him to death while our man begs, please, officer, I can't breathe, or to spot the release of his spinal fluids crawling the cold concrete in the shape of River Jordan while bystanders record videos and beg, please, bro, you're killing him. So I set out to put the bluebird box to rights. But a house sparrow attacks me. And I realize in this terrible world, I cannot save even one desperate bluebird fluttering before infinity, begging me. So I want to thank you all so much for listening to me today. And I wish you all so much success with your writing. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, that was an amazing overview of, of uh, approaches that we can take uh, when we set out to write a poem. Uh, I know that you don't know this, but many of the um, windows that you opened uh, in your presentation, we will explore in greater depth in some of the later panels of this series. And so I want to thank you for uh, that excellent introduction. Um, we're going to jump from uh, Appalachia to the south of England. Jeremy Page is the director of the Center for Language Studies at the University of Sussex. 
and the founding editor of the Frogmore Papers, founded in 1983, and recently edited the paper's 97th edition. He published his first chapbook, Bliss, in 1989, and has subsequently published four further chapbooks and two full collections, most recently, Closing Time, Pindrop Press. A new collection, The Naming, is scheduled for publication in September. Recent poetry has appeared in Poetry Ra Wales, The Stony Thursday Book in Ireland, and Analog Sea Review. Welcome, Jeremy Page. Thank you very much, Stan. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. Now, as I ask Carrie, what entry points might you give for an aspiring poet? A wise poet, and I can't remember which wise poet, once said uh, that if he knew where poems came from, he'd go there more often. Um, and I think the true answer is that none of us really know quite where poems come from. Um, but um, thinking back to what Carrie was saying about place, we all know, we may not know that place, but we all know a place. We all know a place that we can speak about with some authority. Um, and place is a very important element in my poetry too. Um, and very often a collision of time and space is what prompts um, a poem for me. And I'm particularly interested in the, in the kind of associative uh, power of place in resonances and echoes. Uh, and I'm, I think, in a sense, very fortunate in that I, I grew up in a place that is simultaneously totally unremarkable and actually very distinctive. Um, it's a small town on the south coast of England, um, typical of the kind of seaside towns that um, are in genteel decline along the south coast. Um, but it's also a place with a very rich um, history, uh, lots of, uh, a lot of uh, kind of very eminent literary figures either visited or, or lived there. Charles Dickens spent quite a lot of time there. H.G. Wells spent a lot of time there. Joseph Conrad, Henry James, uh, George Bernard Shaw all visited. Samuel Beckett improbably got married there. Uh, because it was the closest place to France and he didn't have to travel very far. Um, Gandhi came ashore at Folkestone. Uh, William Joyce, uh, otherwise known as Lord uh, Horbor, claimed that the town had been destroyed by German bombs in 1939. Uh, and it was also the site of the first recorded beauty contest in Britain, improbably as well. So it's it's an interesting place from that perspective. In many ways, totally unremarkable, but yet with all these layers of kind of history and association. Um, and the first poem that I'm going to read and talk about a bit is a poem uh, that came about um, as the result of the, the anniversary of, a, of a, the death of a, a very close friend of mine who, who died very young um, and on the 10th anniversary of his death, um, a gang of us kind of reconvened in our hometown. And it was the first time that we had been together in that place for literally decades. So there was a kind of reunion. We brought, we brought our kind of collective histories and uh, memories of, of the place with us. Um, and that, and I realized that I, I, I really wanted, maybe needed, to kind of write about the experience of this coming together of this group of people who hadn't been together in that place for such a very, very long time. And I knew what elements I wanted to include in the poem, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with the poem. And I didn't know, I didn't have a clear sense of how I would weave the various elements together. Um, until I came upon the idea of uh, casting the poem, if you like, as uh, the response to an examination question. Um, and that is what lies behind the slightly quirky title, um, a resubmission for the ordinary level examination in psychogeography. And it might just help to give a little bit of context to that. Ordinary level examinations are what we used to do in England at the age of um, 16, if we were even vaguely academic. Um, 
there never was an ordinary level examination in psychogeography, uh, but it might have been an interesting one if there had been. Um, but uh, the definition of um, psychogeography that I'm working to really in this poem is um, the composition of a mental map transposed upon the physical layout or coordinates of place. So um, I cast the poem as effectively two papers in an examination. Um, and I'll read the poem now and then say a little bit more about it um, uh, when, I've, when I've done that. So resubmission for the ordinary level examination in psychogeography. April 1. Oh yes, and I am stepping ashore, ashore, ashore. So many steppings ashore. Back in Blighty, Christmas Eve's only foot passenger, and my father, the welcoming party's only guest. Ashore, ashore. For I suffered the sea to get home. Dean, 2008. Ashore, and one minute on Remembrance Hill, it's a century ago, and Walter, 1897 to 1916, Youngest sibling and unluckiest, great uncle I never knew, is marching to his death on the killing fields of France. The next, Julie London, is crying a river over me, despite my hair, those flares. But all I want, must have, is a ticket for T-Rex, to see Mark Boland before he dies. And question two, asks me to define myself in relation to this place at no fewer than three and no more than five points in my life. So here's the Dickens theme pub, two bars as two cities, two cities in two bars, where Jono's granddad lost the family fortune in a game of poker in the London bar, Ophidius Albion, while in the Paris, Fabienne made my every wish come true, draped her stockings round my neck, long before Julie cried that river, and her shoe, with its impossibly high heel, cast in bronze, became the star of this year's summer exhibition and how that takes me back. Here is a numbered stone for every man who marched down Remembrance Hill to his death on the Somme, Walter, number 1897. And this is where Sam Beckett stayed when the time had come to wed, to experience the suffering of being in a whole new way. And the fairground lights take years to reach me as I look down on them and see myself on dodgems, half a life ago. And Walter never did return, any more than I can slip back 40 years to that fairground, those dodgems, those brightly burning lights. Paper two. But we, re but we reassemble on the clifftop, a random dozen now, to remember Jono, with all the baggage we've acquired, while he took with him no more than he brought when he went. And I have less than some and more than others. Nothing that compares to that huge trunk, but encumbered nonetheless. And we do remember, Jono, all of us, the fairground lights, the paths that led from there to here, from then to now, our yesterdays and all of our tomorrows. The, um, the Scottish poet Robin Robertson uh, once said, um, our first 18 years form a sensibility, a way of looking at the world and making sense of it, a patterning like a frown line on the forehead that doesn't go away. And I think that's very, very true. Those, the impressions, the, uh, the recollections of those, first, uh, of those first 18 years or thereabouts uh, become ever clearer. They, they, they remain with you in a quite extraordinary way. And if you're not very far away from the age of 18, you may not appreciate that yet. But when you get to my age, you realize how much better you understand what was happening when you were 16 than what was happening when you were, let's say, 52. Um, so that seems to me a, a significant insight into what I'm, what I was trying to do with that. Poem. I, I was, if you like, trying to negotiate territory that I found quite difficult between fact and fiction, between uh, there and here, between then and now. Most of all of the content of that poem has a personal resonance for me. And part of the challenge was to seek to make those personal resonances interesting for the reader or the listener. Um, and you're better placed to comment on whether I succeeded in that than I am. Uh, I hope I did, at least to some degree. But um, 
the writing of that poem for me was a strangely, I almost want to say cathartic exercise. It really enabled me to explore what the place meant to me, what that group of friends meant to me, um, and what our kind of collective association of place uh, with the place actually actually meant. Um, and writing from a sense of place, again, very much as, as Carrie was, was saying, actually, is such a strong impetus for poetry, I feel. We all surely have places that are significant to us and that we know in our own individual way. Um, in the case of this particular place, um, another thing I am conscious of is that I haven't lived there since I was 18. Quite neatly, I moved away when I was 18. But I go back, well, pre-COVID, I went back on a regular basis. Um, not frequently, but regularly. I still have family there. The, the house in which I grew up is still there. My brother lives in it. I can stay there where I can just show up there if I feel the need in normal circumstances. So what became very clear to me was that every time, every time I go back, I go back as a slightly different person. I'm taking back a whole new realm of experience with me. So that actually subtly alters my perspective on a place that I, in a sense, know very, very well but no differently each time I return to it. And similarly, the place. Uh, there, are, there are constants about the place and there are things that change about the place. And that kind of interaction with me as subtly different and the place as subtly different is a great spur to poetry, I find, and, and, and really a great impetus to write. That poem, I, I said uh, at the outset, that, that poem, I, I, I began, if you like, with a number of ingredients which I knew I wanted to weave into the poem but didn't really know how I was going to weave them into that poem and it ended up being I think probably the longest the longest poem I've ever written. Um, by contrast um, the the second poem I'm going to read and talk about came about in a very in some ways in a very different uh, way. I the experience that prompted it was the experience that I describe in the poem, uh, finding a postcard in a drawer. Um, and when I found this postcard in the drawer, I, it, it, I, I was immediately clear that this was, um, this was a significant event, if you like, and that I wanted to write about it. Um, my mistake was that I, I thought I wanted to write about it um, in rhyming couplets. And the initial version of this poem was written in rhyming couplets, and frankly, it was terrible. Um, I realized that what I produced was a monster, and that the only place that was deserving of it was the waste paper bin, uh, and that's where it went. And that was a strange act of liberation. I realized my mistake. I did indeed want, or if you like, need to write about this experience. Um, but uh, it definitely didn't need to be expressed in rhyming couplets. Um, that was, it became clear to me once I completed that draft, it was just so wrong. Um, and as I say, that was liberating. And when I actually came to write this draft, I found that the poem, it, it almost wrote itself. So the method of composition was very, very different from the method of composition for the resubmission for the ordinary level examination in psychogeography. It was almost as if the postcard had kind of triggered a whole slew of emotions and images, um, real events that were sunk very deep um, and needed somehow to find expression and did um, in, the, in the final version of the poem, which I hope is a significant improvement on its earlier incarnation in rhyming couplets. But again, I'll leave it for you to judge. This is Postcard of Odessa. Clearing out another drawer, I come across the postcard quite by chance. Sepia, faded, the city's name in Cyrillic script. And before I know what I'm doing, I'm composing your name in characters that are as unfamiliar to me now as you are. 
40 odd years on from the picnic on the Potemkin steps. The glass is raised to, to toast our futures in the cheapest Soviet vodka and all the innocence you coaxed from me so tenderly. In a sense, coming across that postcard brought back to me what a very life-changing event, an overland trip by bus to Odessa when I was 17 had been. Um, and I, I, it was one of those things that I had always kind of known, but I knew much better and knew with much more certainty once I'd actually <laughs> written that poem. Um, but what was interesting for me as I said before, really, was I think of all the poems I've ever written, and I've been writing poems since the mid 1980s. Um, I don't remember another poem that wrote itself in quite the way that that poem wrote itself. Now, whether the earlier incarnation that ended up in the bin was a necessary prelude to this poem writing itself, I can't really say because obviously I did write that other poem of which no record remains. Um, but um, it was fascinating for me that actually it, it did, it just, it just, it came out, it, it, it wrote itself. And yeah, I, I made a, a few adjustments around the edges, but the, the first, I looked at the first draft the other day, almost identical, of this second incarnation, the other day, and it was almost identical to this. So um, again, I hope the resonance that the event that prompted it had for me has some kind of resonance um, for people reading and listening to the poem. Uh, but as poets, all we can hope for really is that what we write connects with the people who read or listen. Um, that's my hope. Um, and to extend that a little bit further, just to the hope that um, there are people out there who share, who inhabit the same, if you like, moral universe that you inhabit and try to give expression to in your writing. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for joining us today uh, from your evening and our afternoon here. We're, uh, we're excited by the different voices that we hear, and, and certainly you and Carrie have different voices that you bring to us, and yet both of them are very real and very uh, vital uh, in the things that you have to express. Um, and you ended with that uh, comment about um, that resonance that you achieve with the reader or with someone else. And uh, for many of us, that is an, an elusive quality that we hope is there and we're never quite sure. And yet for others of us, that's where we ground ourselves. Um, and what I'm referring to is the editors and publishers who look at our work and say, yes, that is a poem that resonates. But that is a poem that uh, will reach a great number of readers. And so for the last uh, presenter that we have today, um, I've invited Barbara Westwood Deal. She is the founding and senior editor of the Baltimore Review. Her fiction and poetry have been published in a variety of journals, including Quiddity, Potomac Review, Little Patuxent Review, Thrush Poetry Journal, Atticus Review, The MacGuffin, and also a poem in The Telephone Project. We're glad to have you here, Barbara. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes. Uh, before you give us some insight into what an editor might look for in poems, tell us just a word or two about the Telephone Project. Sure. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. The Telephone Project is this enormous ekphrastic art project uh, directed by the wonderful Nathan Langston and his team, uh, including the Baltimore webmaster, who did a lot of the front end work for that, um, with over 900 artists of various kinds, including poets, of course, from 72 countries. <clears throat> it's like the kids game of telephone, some of us call it gossip, but with one art form whispering to another art form, inspiring, translating, sparking, and you can check it out online. You can spend hours wandering the pathways of telephone. And if you have any inspiration for a poem, works of art, by the way, are a great way to begin. <laughs> I used to go wander museums, can't do that anymore right now, but, uh, but you can do it on, on the telephone project. 
So what makes the poetry submission stand out for the Baldwin Review? Well, a number of things that Carrie and Jeremy have mentioned, place, I love place in a poem, that's fabulous. Um, but it boils down to, I think, that magical mix of surface pleasure with an underlying power and complexity that provokes an emotional and memorable response. Well, that's kind of a big concept, isn't it? Anyway, <clears throat> I like a poem. It's a pleasure to read out loud. I love to be able to read a poem out loud and love the sounds of it. And it's written in a form that complements its content and is capable of penetrating me and lodging somewhere deep inside. I always say the total should be greater than the sum of its parts. Two plus two has to equal five, <laughs> which is kind of a hard concept, but yeah. There should be more of the poem than what's on the surface. But surface pleasure is important. Surface pleasure is what keeps the reader engaged. Uh, so rich, evocative imagery and carry, you know, other poems have showed that definitely. Pleasurable sounds, all that assonance and alliteration, everything that we talk about. Line lanes and white space that help with a poem's appearance, but more importantly, contribute to the music and meaning of a poem. But beyond surface pleasure, it's got to go below the surface, got to dive. It's wonderful when a poem has layers and depth, uh, when a poem is worth reading more than once, and not because I'm struggling to comprehend the poem, <clears throat> but because it's enjoyable and each reading brings something new to me, some new understanding, or it touches a different chord inside, or I see the way that different parts connect and cohere and work together in some amazing way. That's just so cool, every reading bringing something new. Of course, we want to see attention to craft, effective and not arbitrary line and stanza breaks, um, all the things that all writers should have down pat, spelling and grammar and word usage, <clears throat> punctuation, logical flow. And we shouldn't have to stumble and reread certain groups of words several times to make sense of them. A pleasing rhythm concise and precise language, a fresh use of figurative language, not cliched, so pleasing to the eye and the ear and the mind. There should be something interesting in almost every line, no stretches of dead flat lines with nothing to pique reader interest. Uh, I call them the language deserts. There shouldn't be much in the way of language deserts. A poem should be striking on its own. Uh, some poems might be fine snuggled up against other poems in a set or in a book, but they don't stand up so well on their own. Uh, like when you read poem number 43, looking at flowers in the gardens. No, it's, they may be great in that set, but maybe they don't stand up so well on their own. Uh, usually we only publish one poem out of a submission, occasionally two, but poems really do have to stand up on their own. We want poems that make readers feel that they're in good hands, that the poet has an excellent command of the language and subject matter. There's a sense of authority, confidence, that the poet knows how to assemble the best words in the best order to steal from Samuel Taylor Coleridge for the most powerful effect. We want poems that are fresh and surprising. We read an awful lot of poems and I really want to be surprised of that avoid tired subjects or approach more familiar subjects in new ways. Poems that are able to make us more empathetic human beings, like good fiction. I think poems do this too. Poems that don't leave us with a flat, well, so what, sort of feeling. You know, we definitely want to be feeling something when we arrive at the end of that poem. I mentioned those stretches of dull lines, the uh, <clears throat> language deserts. For me, it's especially important for poems to end on a powerful and not ho-hum sort of note. A couple examples. <clears throat> Matthew Littman, we published his poem, American Typewriter, years ago. And it's from a typewriter's point of view, which is somewhat unusual. But it ends this way. <clears throat> and when you come with your vision of the desert, your heart breaks so worn, your letter to the editor, I will be quiet. And then I will smash your words into the white page. <laughs> So, woo, you know, it's, it's pretty dramatic. Not that endings always have to end with like crashes and bangs. They, they don't. A more subtle example is uh, Mary Artery's poem in a more recent issue, Kawana Campsite. <clears throat> it's about working in a wilderness therapy camp and a detoxing woman is mentioned in the poem. And the poem ends with these two lines. 
an owl called out the dark, <clears throat> and the embers pulsed like living jewels, red, black, red, still breathing. I love this ending. Yes, there is a literal campfire. There are also the women in the camp, and these women are value. They are jewels, and they are still breathing despite their troubles and their detoxing, having all these problems. So it's, you know, it's a really tight, powerful ending for me. I also like poems, like prose, that teach me something new. I love to find out things about the field of science or music, you know, things that, I love learning new things that poet did some research. Things that happen beyond the poet's personal world, but are definitely touching on that personal world. So I love poems that teach me new things. We also love prose poems. And we consider them right along with lineated poems. They're not a separate category for us. I love prose poems. A few things that can be problematic, at least for us. I'm not going to go into that too much. Uh, essentially the opposite of everything I've mentioned. Little evidence of an understanding of the craft and what separates a poem from other forms of writing. A poem is its own thing. It's a whole field all to itself. An appearance on the page that doesn't complement and enhance the experience of the poem. I call them, you know, forgive me, the refrigerator magnet poems where it looks like just words are thrown up. That's personal idiosyncrasy. And all the editors on the journal and probably from any journals, we all have our separate idiosyncrasies. I say, when we can agree on a poem, it's a miracle. <laughs> so I won't go into all of mine. And for everything I'd mentioned, you'd probably find some exception in the journal. Uh, what's wonderful for me may not, you know, be wonderful for another editor. So like I said, it's something of a miracle when we all actually agree on something. Uh, but then again, we all agree about <clears throat> some things. Like we see poems are degrading to any particular group of people. You know, sexist, racist, you know, forget it. It's automatic, gone. Political rants. Um, just getting up on a soapbox. No. A topical work that isn't addressed in some fresh and artful way. Yes, we do want to see things that uh, you know, are relevant to what's happening in the world now, but it's got to be done in an artful way and bringing something new to the table, not just saying the same old tired things we've been hearing. Say it in a new way. Because we, we want to publish poems that we think are going to endure. They're still going to be around and loved and understood for years to come. Uh, we tend to lean away from very young writers, usually high school students. Uh, but I often include the New Pages Guide for Young Writers link when I send a decline email for them. <clears throat> the New Pages Guide lists many publications that welcome work from young writers. So a uh, few of the nuts and bolts things. A few things to consider before submitting to the Vulgar Review and probably a lot of other journals. Please spend some time reading sample work in journals before you submit. Not that you have to write poems that look and sound like the ones <clears throat> that you read, and most editors really like to be surprised. Uh, but you don't want your work to be terribly out of place either. Also, you wouldn't want to be embarrassed to have your work appear in those journals. And it's, I think it's probably happened to more than one of us. We published something and thought, oh, not a good fit, really. Uh, so check out the masthead, uh, check the look of the journal. Some have ads floating all over the place, which makes me a little crazy. So check the look of the journal, consider fees and payment. Some of that might be important to you. Some of it might not be important to you, but you have to think about what's important to you. Of course, follow the submission guidelines. You know, we ask for three poems, but people send us five all the time. Um, um, Professional courtesy, once you submit your work, try not to withdraw it and resubmit revisions or add notes about, oh, no, I found a typo sort of thing. It's just, and I get these every day, at least a couple every day, and, you know, makes me a little bit crazy. I'm seeing more and more of that. Uh, it's really best to thoroughly proofread your work before submitting. And some journals put caps on the number of submissions they'll take. So um, if they're constantly getting the oops, I goofed withdrawals, it could be a problem for some that have like limited submittable plans. A uh, personal idiosyncrasy of mine is pen names. I know that people have been using pen names since the dawn of time, but I really prefer that writers own the work that they do by using their own name. But what's especially concerning is if a writer is using a name that represents them as someone else. Like, um, 
like a white male writer who's using an Asian pen name. Big problem. So it's really best to use your own name or some version of your own name, something pretty close. Um, like many journals, like I said, we use Submittable and we receive thousands and thousands of submissions every year. We went over 9,000 last year and we're trying to actually you know, cut back on that. Out of those, we can only publish about 15 to 20 in each quarterly online issue. And everything we publish online, we put together into an annual print compilation. So we have to watch how many we publish. Plus, we do pay writers. And I'm a business person, too. And I have to you know, watch my budget. And uh, yeah. So the reading process. Uh, we have a lot of editors, readers, interns. We have a lot of people reading you may not see on our staff page. They vote and comment on submissions. They assign them on to others. If they want to get additional thoughts, you're assigning one saying, hey, guys, look at this one. Uh, when you see a submission status change from received to in progress, it just means that someone has voted on it, commented on it, or assigned it on to someone else. <clears throat> I can't read submissions without the status ever changing, just so you know. I've had people accuse me of not reading their submission because they never saw the status change. Well, I can't be reading it. If you have a poem or two accepted by another journal, uh, just send us a message in Submittable and we'll no longer consider those particular poems. Some writers make the mistake of withdrawing the entire submission. If they do that, you know, we're never going to see. A lot of times we just archive it, boom, it's gone, and then they wonder why didn't they ever read the other ones. Uh, we do encourage simultaneous submissions. I think most journals do now. It's only fair considering how long we can hold them sometimes. It's only fair. We try to keep ours at four months or less. Uh, when we accept a poem, among other terms, <clears throat> we ask for first North American serial rights and the right to publish the work in our annual print compilation. We attach an agreement as submittable. <clears throat> our writers simply click a box to indicate their agreement. Great new feature now. Some people care about contracts, some not so much. We just recently started using contracts. Because I had some problems with people like publishing work you know, it was on our website, and then years later they'll say, oh, I want you to take it down off your website. And that really, you know, sort of became a problem for me. Um, I want to remind you that everyone gets declined emails. We all do. Is there anybody here that has never got a declined email? Raise your hand. <laughs> I said they never got a declined email. <laughs> so if you do, if you do blow it off and go back to your writing. <laughs> you no need to respond to them. <clears throat> Journals can only print a small percentage of what they get. So I hope you'll try to make the process of writing more important than rushing your work out into the world to accumulate publication credits. You can find joy in imagining and creating and surprising yourself and in learning everything you can about the craft. Plus a lot of cool stuff from research. And I believe you'll become a better and happier writer in the long run. Oh, one last thing, I recommend becoming a supportive member of the literary community. Read the work of others, join writers groups, consider volunteering as a reader for a journal. Journals almost always need the help and it can be an eye-opening experience for writers to see the editor side of Submittable. Often volunteering can help writers become better at their craft. Seriously, you really do. And you may make some new and wonderful friends in the process of working with the journal. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, it's uh, amazing how, how much I hear my voice coming through you while you're talking, the things that I want to say to students over and over, and thank you for expressing them for us. Um, we're going to take some time to talk a little bit. Uh, if you want to send in a question, now is the time to do it. Uh, but uh, I just want to thank our, uh, our panelists, not only for, um, for sharing their wisdom uh, about the, the poetry writing process, but by sharing a little bit of their lives with us as well, and, and I appreciate them doing that. Uh, and the, the idea of, of place that Carrie started us with... Um, is one that we're going to explore a little bit later in another panel, but I, I want to take a moment and talk about the fact that, uh, that 
place as we have seen it demonstrated by both Carrie and uh, Jeremy, is not always a geographical uh, designation. Place can be psychic. You know, the place where your head is at a moment. Place can be emotional. It can be, you know, what you're feeling and, and you don't know why until you start probing in and exploring and trying to put some kind of parameter on that. And so uh, I think it's interesting uh, that something that can be so very specific can also be metaphoric. Uh, you know, the, 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 the literal place and what it represents can be quite diverse. Uh, and so the first assignment that, uh, that I give in, in a class like this is always simply to observe something. Um, but as Carrie points out, you can't observe something outside of its location. You know, something is housed, something is held, something is framed. Um, and uh, poets are pretty good at looking outside the frames. Uh, you might start by looking at an object and then realize that what really interests you is not that object, but the fact that there was a glow behind it from something else entirely. Um, and so uh, as young poets, I think we want to be open to exploring wherever our mind takes us. And I don't know if any of the other um, panelists want to want to chime in and, and reinforce that uh, but I w would welcome if any of you do. But that's what I wanted to say about, you know, place is both specific and uh, representative. Anyone want to jump on that? I'll just say very briefly that I think in, in writing about place, what I find is that you sometimes discover things about your connection to place that you wouldn't necessarily have known without the writing process. So it can, and so the act of writing the, the poem itself almost becomes like a, a journey of discovery. And um, when, it, when it works, when it really works, you arrive at the end of the poem knowing something that perhaps you didn't really know when you started it. I'll add to Jeremy's comment by saying uh, a lot of the writing that I do is really about healing. And so you start the poem thinking that you are going to educate someone. In my case, I'm going to educate people about Appalachia. And by the time I get done, what I have written about, that spooling out of all that comes into my mind, considering what I'm writing about, ends up being therapy for me and it's very healing and um, I'm a huge proponent uh, believer in poetry healing being one of the healing uh, gifts that we are given and uh, Stan mentioned that I worked with incarcerated teens and adults and women in recovery over the winter and it was one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done I've never been quite so humbled as uh, doing that work and uh, and it, it, it can be healing for you. So I mention this because when someone does you wrong, don't stew about it, write about it. You know what I'm saying? And, and you may start out with anger or, or hurt feelings or outrage, but you'll be surprised where that will take you. And that journey will heal you and it will teach you so much about drafting a poem and allowing whatever you call it, the muse, the, 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 that entity inside your head that's always saying, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. Um, you know, running around in there, um, you'll be surprised what that will do for all of that. So keep that in mind as you, um, as you do this journey um, and you're given an assignment for a class and something else happens to you during that time, you might consider writing about if the topic is right about a car and somebody uh, got in front of you in line, try to make that happen. You know, try to put those things together and try to grow and heal from that. And your, your poetry will do so as well. So I kind of went jagged there, but still. 
<laughs> no, and that, that's exactly uh, the kind of conversation that I think is beneficial for us, Carrie. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking as you were, as you uh, talk about, we set out to what, write one kind of poem, and we end up going a completely different direction. That's what Jeremy was talking about with his postcard in Odessa. Um, and uh, I agree, there are some poems that the writing process is a healing process for us. Uh, it, it's an exploratory process. Uh, it can be healing. Um, sometimes that's not the poem you want to publish, though. Sometimes the healing is for you, and the poem has to take another turn uh, before it's finally finished. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that particularly beginning writers overlook is how many drafts a poem might go through before it really does what what the poet wants it to do. Um, and you know, there are some poems that I have worked on for years. I have no idea how many drafts I've been through, and there's something just not quite right on it. And uh, you know, if you're in a class, obviously you don't have years, you know, for a poem to uh, to germinate. Um, but recognize that the first draft, the third draft, the fifth draft still might not be the right one. Um, and I don't know, uh, again, if any of the rest of you want to, to talk about the, the drafting and the kinds of things that happen in that uh, process. I will say just one thing, and then I'm going to stop because I've had a lot of my say. But one of the best, uh, the best advice I was ever given uh, once I started writing poetry, and I've only been writing poetry since 2009, was never write a poem, never write to with the uh, idea of getting published because you just need to write, you need to write. And if don't get hung up on the publishing thing, cause that's a judgment thing, right? You're being judged when you send things in for publication and that can set you back a little bit too. You've got, you've got uh, professor Galloway for that right now to help you, you know, strengthen your poems. But uh, you might want to hold off on, on sending out for publication for a little while just to give yourself that time to breathe and create and just let it be a thing before it becomes this huge, heavy thing in which you have to watch your submittable window every day to see if it's in progress and see if it. And a lot of times in my submittable, uh, mine go into my promotions folder and they don't even come into my email. So I might not know for a couple of weeks that I've even had something accepted or rejected. So I'm just going to throw that out there that we should be writing because we need to write and we, we have a gift and, 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 and we have something to say that's important. Now, whether it needs to be published or not, yes or no, uh, you know, but it's important that you write what you need to write, what's important to you. Yeah, I wanted to mention, <laughs> yeah, a lot of submittable emails go right to my junk email, so I check it constantly. But another idea of place is what people do for a living, what you do to just get by every day and pay the bills, pay the rent. That is the place that you're coming from. And I found that a lot of poems and stories for me are poems that use what people do for a living in them, whether they're teachers or they work in a pawn shop or they're a waitress or they work in a cemetery. To me, it really makes it real. And students, if you have jobs that you may think, ah, this is a boring, crummy job, who would want to read about this? Well, yeah, maybe we do want to read about that. And the more specific you make it, you know, if we see the, the grease on the fryer, whatever, if we can see that, if it's specific, we can smell it. It's real. So, yeah, bring that place to us. And further to what um, Barbara's just said, I mean, as, as an editor, when I'm choosing poems, I am, and I think this is, I guess this is probably true for most editors, I am I am drawn to poems that need to, to be, needed to be written. Um, and not poems that were written because, you know, if you like, on, on a whim at the extreme end of it. But I think there is a real sense that you can um, you can detect when a poem just, it just needed to be written. And it could be a poem on a seemingly mundane topic, but it needed to be said. And I think the successful poet is the poet that conveys that. This, this, this is something I needed to say, and this is something that you need to hear. Now, of course, the reader, as ever, will make their own judgment, but um, that's the, the kind of... The, that's, that should be, it seems to be, part of the, the poet's calculation if, if he or she is, um, is, is aiming for 
for publication, which is another matter that we've just touched on. One other thing I was just thinking of, Stan, in relation to what you said about drafting and redrafting, I, I would just like to underline, for me at least, the importance of, of the notebook as an artifact. And for me, probably it's a generational thing because I'm of a certain age. It's a physical notebook, and uh, I can't—I just can't do it on, on a screen. But I have a—I have notebooks in which I note down any kind of potential prompts for a poem or inspiration for a poem. And sometimes I don't do anything with it. I don't know what to do with it. But I have had the experience of coming back to a prompt years later and thinking, ah, that's what I need to do with that particular line or that particular prompt or that particular idea. And literally many years later. So I never throw I never throw notebooks away. And I try not to filter what I put in the notebooks because in my experience you never know what might prove of value to you down the track. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent uh observation. And uh I know that many of uh of the people listening are at the early stages of writing and uh you know, for some of them, maybe they've been a poet, you know, for three days now, uh, or, you know, at the end of uh, of the month, they will have been a poet for three weeks. Um, but also think of the fact that you may be a poet three years from now, you may be a poet 30 years from now. Um, the, the thoughts that you have now, they have a place, but you may not know where they connect at this point. And so much of poetry is making those right connections uh, between uh, an image, a sound, a smell, you know, whatever it is that, uh, that catches your attention. Um, and so, you know, even if I, as, a, as an instructor, inquire, require you to submit your poetry, um, you know, as, uh, as our panelists have said, um, don't necessarily think that's the end. Uh, it might be that you know what you submit and you get a rejection from you know at the end of summer is something you say well let me go back to that let me th think how I can do this differently um, and you resubmit it somewhere else you know in the fall and you get an answer in the spring um, yeah, th this is not a uh, a fast food industry uh, you don't get your your answers very quickly. And in fact, uh, for those who are, are with me for three weeks uh, in this venture, um, you probably won't get any answers in the three weeks that we're together. Uh, even if you were to submit today, uh, there are very few places that would get back to you, you know, that quickly. So um, for me, when I put something into submittable or I submit you know, through another means, I do my very best to block it out, to forget it ever happened. Um, because hanging on to that just keeps me from producing other things. Once you, su once you submit it to someone to look at, start working on the next poem or start working on the next, you know, whatever it is that you do uh, for uh, intellectual stimulation. So um, I want to go to Brittany before, uh, before we get too far into this and see what she has uh, from you. All right. Um, I've actually got two questions that were sent in, um, both of which are going to go out to both Carrie, Jeremy, and Barbara, so all of you can feel free to chime in. Um, so the first question is, would like to know that when it comes to poetic form, how much does the appearance of the poem come into play? So whether that's being handwritten, whether it's typed, the alignment of the lines, the font choice or anything like that, or if it's accompanied by artwork or images, and they'd like to know how and if that can help bring the meaning of the poem across. Well, I'll say that uh, we really don't need um, artwork to accompany submissions. With me, the most important thing is just the way the line breaks and stanza breaks and the way white space are used, as long as they complement the poem and they enhance the experience of the poem. I will say that if poems are very blocky and all jammed up together, long lines, it's, it's blocky. It kind of <laughs> makes a reader's eyes glaze over at times. They, the, it, it shouldn't be arbitrary. It should be done with intent. And I guess I, I would add to that, if a poem on the page 
is, is what appears to be a random mix of very short and very long lines with the odd kind of mid-length line thrown in, then that could be fine, but there needs to be a very good reason why the poem looks like that. Um, and if there isn't, it's just going to look wrong. Um, I mean, in terms of, of how a poem looks on the page, though, ultimately, my, my first, second, third, fourth, however many drafts it takes, are normally written out in, in longhand. And it's, it's at that point that I transfer onto a screen and see what it actually looks like on, on screen. And I, I actually find that method works quite well for me. I've spoken to quite a lot of other people who, who seem to work with that method to people who aren't comfortable composing on a computer keyboard. Uh, but there, there's a stage when you've been through the various revisions you need to go through in longhand where it is actually helpful to see what it looks like. And, and that's, that's for me where the kind of the, the finer judgments about, for example, line breaks and white space can best be made. I would only add that I would read all you can about line breaks because they are so important. If you are using form as in formal form, I want you to read about that too. If you're uh, writing a poem about schizophrenia and you want to just jumble that all down the page, then I think that would have purpose because you've written a poem about schizophrenia. And so that's how schizophrenia might feel to you or or to a loved one or whoever you've gotten this experience from. Otherwise, I think it's it's prudent to uh, keep your poetry tidy. And as both uh, uh, Jeremy and Barbara have said, there needs to be a very uh, clear and explicit reason why you would decide to leave a big gaping white space in one of your lines or you're not really trying to make art on the page with your words unless, as I mentioned, you have a poem that just is crying out for you to spill it down the page for some reason. And there are some poems that, that definitely, um, you know, can handle that. And, but when I think of form, I think of Sistina. I think of uh, Ghazal. I think of the different forms of poetry which require very stern specific specific um, um, techniques to be used uh, otherwise if you're talking about how the how the poem looks on the page that's line breaks and stanza breaks and um, and that sort of thing that can be very powerful and necessary to navigate your your reader uh, through the poem uh, I would stick to basic font. I'd stick with Times or Garamond. I don't know you, Barbara, you're, you're the expert on that, but I don't think you want any curly Q uh, fonts coming to you because they're very difficult to read. Um, and um, often they do not represent a poem well. Um, I don't usually use bold type unless there's a really good reason that something should be bold. I do on occasion italicize something, but it's usually if somebody is speaking or I'm quoting someone or, um, or that, uh, that's another way to have a word pop out on the page. And I usually submit everything in 12 point type. And again, I'll sit back to Barbara and Jeremy about that. Uh, but I think most of our uh, journals are asking for 11 or 12 point type. And the reason is because they copy paste that into their documents. They need it to be as ready as possible because they have read 9,000 poems. And every month they're posting 20 online and then they do a book. And if you have totally goofed up and used all these crazy fonts and made all these dashes and line spot, line breaks and, all this is happening on the page. They have to deal with this on their end, and they may decide it's just not worth it. So don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll add to that. Yeah, some of us have old eyes too, and some fonts will make us crazy. Courier, don't do do courier. No, and uh, we do actually add a tiny bit of white space between all the lines on our website because I really want the poems to be an easy read. For readers there is an article out there you were talking about line breaks oh there's a lot of articles but there's one about six ways to use line breaks which is i really recommend for people i think and uh, i think the poetry foundation there's a link to it on there too but there are good reasons to use line breaks and uh, i really recommend that people read up on them 
sounds like some weird esoteric subject, but no, it's it's one of the tools of our trade, so we should we should be into it. We should think it's cool. Those are all excellent, uh, excellent words for us. Uh, we we will have a panel on line breaks uh, coming up uh, next week, um, and uh, again. As you're talking about what, you know, what does the poem look like on a page, um, what I what I heard all of you saying in one form or another is that it needs to be organic, that the poem, the shape of the poem needs to represent the content of the poem. Um, and that, I think, is one of the first lessons we learn rather than imposing, you know, say, I'm going to write a sestina because I'm going to write a sestina. Well, no, you write a sestina because after you've worked with it a while, you recognize that's the form that embraces what I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, again, I, I'm a, a big advocate of organic form, and uh, I'm sure that it will come up again before this series of panels uh, is done. Um, Brittany, was that two questions or was that one? Um, that was only the first, okay. actually. Um, so again, um, this goes out to all three of you. Um, and I think this is something that you've all more or less touched on within your um, own individual presentations. But they would like to know what drives and motivates you all to write poetry. I didn't know if that was something any of you wanted to elaborate on a little bit in further detail. So. I think it's about need, actually. Uh, for me, I think I just uh, I just feel the need to do it. Um, not always, not invariably. There are lean periods where inspiration is sorely lacking. But um, it, it, I think, it, to me, it does come down to need. It's what I was saying, really, about, about as an editor, choosing poems for publication. It's those poems that kind of needed to be written. Uh, rather than allow somebody to indulge a whim, I think. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, for me, that's that's where they come from. I think. I think I already mentioned mine. I, I want to lift up my people, so that's a big motivator for me. And secondly, it is so healing for me. I I would need a a weekly therapeutic session with a professional if I were not writing poetry. And so I'm saving a great deal of money by <laughs> writing poetry. Um, and I, I kid you not, it is just so, uh, so helpful to me. So those are my motivators. Yeah. And for me, um, words have always fascinated me. And so when, uh, when I hear a phrase, when I hear a word, uh, often my poetry begins from the linguistic beginning rather than necessarily from the observational point of view. Uh, and so I, I think that poems come from a variety of places um, and making connections between sounds and words and visions and uh, you know textures, whatever it is that captures your attention, uh, I, I always want to be making those connections, and poetry seems to be the way to connect things that aren't connected any other way. Uh, so that's uh, that's for me uh, at least one of the motivations that I work with. Okay, and I love anyone... language as well. <laughs> I, I've always loved language since I was a child, and listened to poems when I was a kid. But more than that, I think it's. I needed to. I need to write to find out what matters to me, and it's it's getting it out of me, getting it from inside to the out, and also connecting with other people. Um, it's just important to me to make that human connection. Mm -hmm. And I, I love to play too. And writing should be play. It's it's not all work. I mean, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't be doing it. And it's that fun, I think, that uh, has inspired this series of poetry panels uh, that we are beginning today. We have uh, made history, um, and I want to give a special thanks to Carrie Gunter Seymour, to Jeremy Page, and to Barbara Deal for being our first panelists. And we look forward to seeing all of you uh, online for the next one, uh, where we will uh, meet some more poets and talk more about poetry in detail.
Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye.